CTBK is more than just a full-service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara communities through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2022 to help keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400 and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic, here with my co-host, as always, Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times. And I know that it must give our guest chills to be able to listen to that introduction live, because he listens to it on the podcast so often that when you're there immersed in it and actually part of it, it has to be a thrill uh, for our guest, uh, Scooter Vertino. Uh, he's, uh, he's just getting into the uh, broadcasting game. Uh, you may know him, however, uh, from some uh, things that he's been working on, some side projects and some little minor league deals as the senior vice president of programming and production for Warner Brothers Discovery Sports. And you may say, wow, Warner Brothers Discovery Sports, they're getting into the sports game. That's I've never heard of that. But um I guess I can drop the the facade and say that Scooter Bertino is a 14-time Emmy Award winner for what you used to know as Turner Sports. Uh, he is the uh, overseer of NBA on TNT, which has him in the Broadcasting Hall of Fame. He's the overseer of NHL on TNT, March Madness, MLB on TBS, just, to, just some little things. Uh, <laughs> and we're happy to help you launch your career to the next level. Scooter Bertino, thanks for joining us. Uh, Tim, I appreciate that that introduction and the kind words. Um, I, I probably should clarify that the uh, the crew for Inside the NBA is in the Hall of Fame. I think with the whole a, thing, the whole you're in there. It's the team as, that for the whole team as a team. Yeah, uh, and I do remember where I was when I first got that intro live. I'll always remember today. Uh, typically, I listen to the podcast um, either in the car. Um, uh, some of those late nights at the studio driving home, perhaps when uh, I'm walking the dog. Um, but uh, but yeah, getting it getting it in person is uh, is is certainly special. Uh, Any time I can spend with you, and of course, uh, Buffalo icon Jonah is is also always welcome. So thanks for having me. You know, it's quite the intro. That that reminds me of when Jeff Myers wrote about Bob Dylan, and they read that before every one of his concerts. Now, <laughs> it's in his writing. Yeah, that's true. I, I'm happy to be that person for you, Scooter. Um, <laughs> lest anyone think that Scooter Vertino is just a crazy fan of Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. Uh, he is just a degenerate Bills fan, and we've crossed paths that way, uh, and uh, that's what it is. It really has nothing to do with the quality of this show. Uh, or the entertainment value. He is just looking for every scrap, morsel, and uh, filament of information that he can get regarding his uh, beloved Buffalo Bills. And let's start there before we get into what's been going on with the NBA. You had history happen on your network. LeBron James uh, breaking the all-time yeah. scoring record on Tuesday night. Um, of course, you work with legends in the game. Uh, we can talk about the NHL and the Sabres uh, just in terms of uh, what's been going on at NHL on TNT, losing Rick Tockett to the real world again. Uh, but let's stay with your bills. Uh, you're passionate. You're knowledgeable. Uh, you're constantly talking to folks um, who uh, are better connected than me. Um, how are you digesting this, um, the first few weeks of your, your off season? Pro Bowl games, notwithstanding. Right, right. Uh, yeah, that was a rough one. Um, uh, the the Cincinnati game, and it was one of those where I kept waiting for there to be some type of pivot, and it just, as we know, just wasn't going to occur. Um, 
there was a 30 for, I think it was a 30 for 30 called the, the Four Falls of Buffalo, I think is what the name yep. was, about the Bills Super Bowl run, right? And Steve Tasker had a quote, I think, regarding the second half of the second Cowboys Super Bowl. You guys remember it was real tight going into halftime. And then there were, you know, turn of events that all fell towards the Cowboys and away from the Bills. And I Fumble. think Tasker fumbles. I, I think uh, Washington had a scoop and score and, and something else happened. I mean, it, yeah, it, turnovers just killed them, right? And and, uh, and the game was played right here in Atlanta, if I remember correctly. And um, Tasker's quote was something to the effect of the four years, the back, the back, the back, the back, we were just done. We were spent. We had, there was nothing. We couldn't go to that extra gear. We didn't have it at that point. The grind had been that and I think Tim you wrote something similar recently about the Bills season and I would tend to agree after watching what occurred that they just didn't have that extra gear whatever it was and 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 I think you know for better or for worse a lot of times that comes from Josh Allen and his greatness and his ability to make plays and and create things that aren't there sometimes uh because of his talent and his ability and his um you know, whatever, whatever his God given traits are that, that separate him. Uh, and I'm not taking away from, from all the hard work he puts in either, but it just wasn't meant to be on that particular um, Sunday, which was, which was rough. Um, so I think it was, you know, one of those where you kind of have to process it. And I think somewhere midway through the third quarter, I was like, Oh man, this is not, this is not going to be a miraculous comeback. Um and and then I think in your head as a fan, you start looking towards like, OK, who's a free agent and how are they going to make this work? And Brandon Bean has been a whiz with the cap the last couple of years. But Josh Allen's extensions kicking in and how's this going to affect everything? And I know that everyone has written articles, Jonah, I'm sure you have as well. I've seen Tim. I've seen uh, John Warrow. I've seen um, Jay Skursky. I've seen Joe B. And everyone has their list of, you know, is it. Edmonds is it Poyer is it Oliver is it you know just I, I think Sam Martin's an unrestricted free agent right so it's just a matter of like how do you reconstruct this where do they go in the draft so you're thinking about all this stuff with a quarter to go because there's no comeback coming unfortunately at that point Scooter um, you're and, giving thought to Sam Martin I don't know what? if I've heard those uh two words strung together since the end of the season <laughs> Sam and well, Martin but here we but, are but, but remember, remember about the major controversy before the season even started with the with Ariza, right? Or Ariza, if I'm mispronouncing his lane, name. And what a difference maker he was going to be for the team because they had this, you know, diamond in the rough. Well, not diamond. Everyone knew who it was, I guess. But that he, you know, he had the incredible, uh, you know, brief uh, sample size during the preseason that everyone, you know, fell in love with. So that that's, you know, and I think we were, I think we, the Bills, were supposed to, also pick up um, the Titans punter, right? Who was a, a West New York native, and then that didn't happen. So then they then they pivoted to Sam Martin. So yeah, now he's in the Super Bowl, Super Bowl punter. It, so it, so it, it could have made the difference for the Bills. <laughs> well, I remember uh, uh, Mike Silver, who is a, a you know a highly esteemed NFL writer uh, out of the Bay Area. Um, had written one time about you know you know what he said I think he said you know what good teams never worry about who their punter is and I was like that's ah, probably a good point when everything was you know up in the air about what they were going to do next so a quick uh, as, a quick aside uh, though Scooter and I guess maybe it's not an aside it blends together a couple of things that we've been talking about sure. I've been remiss in my coverage um, over the last few weeks when you're talking about the Bills and hitting this emotional wall to mention the Matt Ariza case. Um, right, and right. when you're talking about Kim Pagula's health, Dawson yeah. Knox's uh, brother right. dying yeah. right before the season begins, uh, the weather situations, both of them uh, moving the game to Detroit that gives them three road games in 12 days that they that they won all of them. Uh, the the mass deaths uh, that occurred uh, at the top shooting and the uh, Christmas storm. Uh, Damar Hamlin, I think the Matt Ariza was, I mean, and at the time it didn't seem like much because it, it was a bit of an outlier, but if you want to, you should probably insert that into the stressors that this team went through for a long time. Um, 
And so Sean McDermott, and I know that. That's why I say Sean McDermott's emotional reaction in a press conference after the matter during the matter situation was similar to some of the reaction to Demar Hamlin from a body language, facial expression kind of thing. Boy, almost crying. I mean, he was super emotional. And and you're, I'm sure. I mean, anyways, I mean that's just one more thing that I think should be added that I have always neglected to include. Uh, actually, because I think that that was a huge. It was a national story that the organization was under fire from uh, around the world uh, and bunker mentality and holy shit. And, you know, that that, right. that did not just go away quickly. So anyways, but my no. uh, something to add. No, it's 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 a great point. It also, by the way, I, I think it also points that, you know, there's always uh, uh, we hear these narratives in, during sports seasons all the time about team of destiny. Right. And so it just shows you that there's no such thing as a team of destiny. If there was a team of destiny, the bills would be playing on Sunday, right? Like if there's a team of destiny, you know, the team that Frank Reich piloted to the comeback against the Oilers would have won the Super Bowl that year. Like there's, it, it only, it, two things, it only goes so far and you're always going to have, no team's going to go through a season where you blow out the competition every game. You're going to have to win close games. The bills did that this year. Um, but there's always going to be a couple of you're going to stub your toe and go, like, gee, I wonder if we could have been better in, in that game. No one's perfect. Um, in spite of what my father may text me after certain games that, you know, we got to blow it all up and this is not going to work. And, you know, and I, I mentioned that if that were the case, then only one team would have continuity from season to season. <laughs> That's the satchel today, Scooter. It uh, posted right before we hit the record button here. Uh, I had questions regarding uh, should they fire Brandon Bean and overhaul the scouting department? Never mind that it is home to and ha- has been home to former GMs, future GMs, guys who get hired to be GMs, uh, right. VPs. Of, like It is one of the most loaded front offices from a talent evaluation standpoint and has been since Brandon Bean got here. Uh, and what? we have fans that want to blow up the scouting department. They want Leslie Frazier fired. They want Ken Dorsey fired. Uh, they just lost, oh, by the way, the guy who won NFL Coach of the Year last night and his <laughs> and Brandon Bean's right-hand man and uh, key members of that coaching staff. I mean, come on. I mean, I get it. I, I know that people are desperate. And and I think that there's a a strong sentiment among the fans of, of all the uh, – all the crap that they've had to deal with as fans uh, dealing with Bill Belichick and Tom Brady bullying them on a year to year basis. Tom Brady's finally out of the division. Now he's out of the game. Not only is it our turn to be a, to be a contender, we are owed a Lombardi trophy by this point. And I don't, I understand it. I, but I think the impatience uh, can get a little maddening. And, and I wonder though, what, I wonder what the four Super Bowl run would have been like uh, during Twitter. Uh, you know, I guess they would have wanted uh, all those guys gone. Polian was eventually, you know, Bill Polian, Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame architect, uh, fired uh, after two Super Bowls. Uh, you know, they would have had Marv gone. Uh, they would have had, uh, you know, maybe it would have helped when it came to the coordinators. Uh, the Bills, when you take a look at Marv's coaching staff, isn't exactly uh, highly decorated. I mean, there are some names on there, Elijah. <coughs> Ted March of Broda, but it, there, it's not like there's a bunch of future uh, Bill Belichick's on that coaching staff. But, anyways, I don't want to. Uh, no, I look. It, dominate it's, the uh, platform here. No, no, I, I, I appreciate the context, right? And and uh, and and I think there's a lot to that. You know, like you wrote an article last year, or the year before. My brain's a little fried these days. Um, when you said, "Hey, look." Bills fans get used to it. They're going to sign your head coach and general manager to an extension. Like nobody had dealt with that since Dick Duran's ill-fated extension that was written, signed upon, and like shoved in a drawer or something. You know, they were too to- ashamed to admit it. Right, right. They never and- sent out a press release that they they signed J- Dick Duran to an extension. They were too ashamed. Yeah, yeah. And so. It's they removed while. him. If you remember, they famously removed him from the team photo. They had a team photo day, you know, where you show up to the stadium first, 10,000 fans get a team photo. If you remember, he was removed. Yeah. They had duplicated somebody. You could see his hand on his knee, but it was somebody, it was nobody there. Uh, and I think that was also the year that Ralph Wilson was that the year he was supposed to get his hall of fame uh, yeah. acknowledgement at halftime. And 
they and they canceled it right because they knew he'd, they'd, he'd get the hell boot out of him anyway that that and that's the crazy thing that wasn't that long ago right like i i i've attended games during some of those eras and when Rex Ryan was going to fix everything and they brought in all the big names and everything felt, I mean, I still remember, you know, going to a game in Washington the day after Christmas um, or boxing day and, um, and getting smoked by Kirk cousins on the way out of town. And the Bills still had a chance to make the playoffs and end the drought. And they just, you know, just shot themselves in the foot so many times with, with different missed opportunities. Um, and then I went to the Jacksonville game um, when they when they finally got over the hump and got into the playoffs. I think you and I may have had breakfast at uh, where were we um, at the uh, uh, Cracker Barrel next to the hotel. We uh, did living life on the uh, on the expense report, and um, and and yeah, look, they got outplayed that game, but it 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 was that like stands the, as uh that stands that stands as attending church uh in jacksonville by the way that was good for uh <laughs> well, you, you attended mass uh when you <laughs> when we had breakfast at the cracker barrel in jacksonville with uh with nelson savello uh famous canisha canisha alum uh and so um you know I, the one thing that game did was well it was a breakthrough obviously right i still remember jumping up and down in my basement when when the when boyd scored for the Bengals, uh and then the the uh flacco couldn't move the ravens on the next drive going to driving down going to the game um but what that did was if, if people probably forget that next year was a disaster right from a record standpoint but that first year bought being a mcdermott time to implement the plan they had to implement or else then you're just throwing bad money after good and good after bad and everything else. And you're in that cycle that teams don't want to be in. It allowed them to at least get out from underneath it. And I think from what I'm told, that was the plan all along. They just happened to not luck into making the playoffs because there's, there's luck with everything that's involved, but they, they kept those. If you remember that first year under McDermott, they, they did, they did luck into the playoffs oh. because well, McDermott well, made yeah. some rookie coaching mistakes that he somehow survived. Uh, Nathan Peterman over Tyrod Taylor, um, punting in overtime of the, uh, or whatever, whenever he punted, to, he was punting to tie when it would have eliminated uh, them against the, in, in the yeah. snow overtime game. Right. Well, but then they also had close games that, that weren't close to the past. Right. And it wasn't, you know, wh whatever philosophy they had undertaken that they were going to try and play close games and win at the end. As a matter of fact, I was at a game here. Uh, the Falcons were coming off the Super Bowl runner up. Um, no one ever talks about it. I think they blew a big lead. It's kind of a small story and no one ever raises it, but they, they were playing the Falcons who were, you know, uh, gangbusters. And um, I think they were down to like Charles Clay as their only option and they beat him here. Um, and so there were certain things that fell into place, but yes, you're right. They, they, that was kind of a charmed season, if you will, for how that, how that all worked out. Yes. There were some, some questionable calls, uh, time management and, and all of that completely warranted, but it, but it bought them a little bit of time. If they had, if they hadn't made the playoffs, if they had just missed, like the bills had just missed several times during the drought. And then they get, you know, their doors blown the next season. Then it's like, okay, now you have to make them, you know, it, 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 it bought that, that, that uh, group, some breathing room. Um, and, you know, you're right about the it, it, having people glean from your staff is a wonderful problem to have, but it really is a case of, OK, how do you recover from it? And, and, you know, looking at the college game, right, like that's that's a Nick Saban problem year after year. He has guys that get plucked and go everywhere from, you know, if you just look at the SEC with the uh, uh, Jimbo Fisher and, and um, uh, Kirby, uh, Kirby Smart at Georgia with back to back. So those are his guys. Right. So. Um, you know, he sees it and they recover. And it's just a matter of, of how you recover. I Look, I've seen the the questions about Dorsey and I've seen the questions about Leslie Frazier. Um, I tend to agree with you, Tim, because you, you're like, look, Leslie Frazier is not operating in a bubble. Like McDermott, Coach McDermott is a defensive coach and a defensive player from, you know, college and I assume high school. Frazier's not doing things that McDermott's not signing off on, right? And so... There's that. And, and 
Dorsey, if you look at the stats between last year and this year, um, I think everything's rather similar. The rankings are rather similar, both offense and defense. Um, I think what people fall in love with is the splash plays that may or may not have been there at times, especially on the defensive end. Um, and I think some of that is, is due to injury. And I get it. Injuries are part of the game. It happens. But Jordan Poirier and Micah Hyde um, were the best safety tandem in the NFL for, I would say, three years running. And that's just my opinion. That's not based on any pro football focused stats or anything like that. Those guys just made play after play after play. They weren't infallible. They made their own share of mistakes, but that's going to happen on the back end. It happens to, to every, every guy in the secondary. But those guys made play after play after play. And Poyer missed some games this year due to injury, and Hyde missed a large part due to injury. And I think that was an absolute killer when it came to, you know, how those guys were able to execute. And I, I, I tend to give Frazier and to a lesser extent McDermott a ton of credit for actually adjusting because of those injuries. So being the executive that you are and a boss man that you are, Scooter, who would you fire? <laughs> I, I, well, I, I'm kind of curious. I, no, I wouldn't fire anybody. Like, I, I, I don't know what the – let me put it to you this way. If you're going to fire someone, right, and, and, and the, the idea is you're going to fire them and replace them with somebody who's better. I don't know – First of all, I don't know enough about position coaches in the NFL to know if there's somebody who's better than uh, what is it, Chad Hall is the receivers coach, and and you could argue that outside of of Stephon Diggs, the the other receivers struggled this year. Um, Stephon Diggs dropped. had a lot of drops too. Well, by the way, like I think two years ago, Stephon Diggs had two drops, right? But it, it's Chad Hall, right? That's his name. Yes. Okay, I knew his last name was Hall. So Chad Hall, Chad Hall is not telling the receivers, Hey, catch it. If you have an opportunity, like if you drop it, it's no big deal. Like that's not being coached. Like he's not telling them it's okay. Like, you know right. what I mean? Like the pitching that, coach walking out to the mound and saying, Hey, throw strikes. Right. It's, it's, you know, I know there's a big saying in the NFL that you're either uh, coaching it or you're allowing it to happen. Like, uh, okay. You know, like th there were a couple plays this year where I, you know, just to start the game, I forget who they were playing and, 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 uh, Josh Allen threw like a, it was, uh, you know, sent everybody deep and he had Singletary kind of out in the left flat and he just kind of dumped it off to Singletary, had 400 yards in front of him and he dropped it. I, I, you know, like it happens. It, it's, I wish it didn't, but it does. So, you know, like it, it, it it's, it's part of the game. And, and, you know, and you then, were aware, I don't know if you brought his name up scooter, but Chad Hall did leave the staff today for the Jacksonville Jaguars. Oh, I did not know that. Okay. So, according to pro football focus, the, the receiving coach with the, uh, who oversaw the second most drops in the NFL has gone to the team that had the most drops in the NFL. Got it. Got it. Okay. Led, well, led by the one and only Zay Jones, by the way. Well, right. So then that's a, pretty poor example on my end because uh, we don't know if he left on his own or if it was a mutual situation. Oh, I think it's a great example because we're going to find out what the bills do at receiving coach. I think that a lot of position coaches are fungible. Um, they are babysitters in a lot of ways because it really is the head coach. And then of course the coordinators uh, and then everybody else kind of takes the marching orders from the coordinators and the head coach and they do the bidding it's and yes, there's some nuance in there and some right. different ways that you approach. But I think the position coaches in the NFL are, are, are somewhat interchangeable. Maybe you need somebody in there for a fresh face. Uh, the right. one thing that I would just say about Chad Hall is that for when it comes to drops, I don't know if it's just focus or maybe he runs a disorganized meeting or maybe he's <laughs> got a, a, a DGAF attitude. I don't know uh, that I, I don't know the behind the scenes, but that's a lot of drops. And uh, so if they are fungible, that's that to me seemed like the place where the bills would say, why don't we, why don't, we might as well make a change. Sure. No, I, I, Hey, look, I, those guys know. I mean, I think that's what people lose track of fans like myself lose track of just how much goes on behind the scenes that fans aren't privy to someone like yourself. When you guys have access to practice, you know, a lot of times it's, this is who was seen during the media portion. I don't think, the Joe Q public understands how small the media portion is in any sport, right? Like 
I think hockey is probably the lone exception where I think the, the media covering the team gets a ton of access to practice versus, you know, the NBA has, has certain rules, um, you know, MLB, I mean, it's, it's batting practice and, and, you know, I guess you see, you see some things during spring training and, and there are some workouts during, um, during the postseason, but it's not a lot. Um, and then the NFL is, you know, always shrouded in secrecy, right? Like, so um, I think I saw, I saw a, I saw a feature on the origin of the Philly special uh, and it was a high school coach, I think in either Louisiana or Mississippi that had come up with it. And he had, sent it out to like a various coaches and, and I'm trying to think of who actually took it at first. Um, and eventually obviously it wound up with, with Frank Reich and, and Nick Foles with the, uh, with the Eagles. Um, but uh, Doug Peterson was asked about working on it during Super Bowl week. And he's like, Oh yeah. He's like all of our practices during Super Bowl week were like, I told Frank to give us the most vanilla sets you've ever seen in your life. We're not doing anything where anyone could actually see it. So my point being that we don't know, you know, you talk about this with your kids, right? Like your kid gets in trouble. You take his or her phone away. Oh, that's kind of harsh. I'm like, yeah, it's strike 12. Like we don't know what's going on with those, with those discussions, with points of emphasis, with, you know, guys are always banged up, right? You're going to find out later about, you know, we always find out that so-and-so had surgery three weeks later on a torn labrum or a, a uh, meniscus tear or whatever. I think Jordan Poirier was kind of an interesting case because we kind of knew what he was dealing with as the season progressed. Um, but then again, there may be some other stuff we have no idea he was dealing with. For the record, I was able to call it up here. The Bills, uh, second to the Jaguars in drops for a team, of course, the Bills played one fewer game. So the Bills, 34 drops in 16 games. Jacksonville Jaguars, 36 drops in their 17 games. Uh, and to take a look at players, uh, Stefan Diggs, and this is according to Pro Football Focus, uh, they, they uh, dinged Stefan Diggs for nine drops uh, tied with Deontay Johnson of the Steelers for most in the NFL this season. And, of course, that one fewer game. Uh, Zay Jones and Christian Kirk each had eight for Jacksonville, uh, tied for third. Uh, and then, uh, Gabe Davis, I'm sure everybody's wondering about that. He had seven. So that puts him in the, I don't know if that's the top seven or the bottom seven. Uh, let's see where, if we have a Dawson Knox sighting on this list, uh, he comes in tied with Isaiah McKenzie with five drops. Um, so, um, Interesting that Chad Hall goes from one dropper to the next dropper. Um, and when you, you say you don't know if he's running a, a DGAF uh, philosophy, which I think is a distant third to a TGAF philosophy. So I just want to clear that up. If, what's in second? <laughs> There's probably a, a big gap. We'll have to figure that out. Uh, you know, I, I the big question to me about that is – and. Uh, Diggs gets a lot of opportunities, a lot of targets. So um, I think yeah, there's that, volume involved. Yeah. And, and look, he's Stefan Diggs has been nothing but fantastic um, on the field since the bills acquired. Him, right. The guy's been, been lights out. Um, if you look at his numbers historically for the bills, I think they're either right up there or they set a new standard each year. I know the game is different than when Andre Reed and, and Eric molds played, Um but he's been he's been lights out, and I and I get that people were concerned that he he was frustrated uh, in that last game. Um, so was I. So you know, like, but it, I think those things kind of work themselves out in the end. The thing that concerns me as a fan would be where Gabe Davis went last year or two years ago in that Kansas City game where he utterly dominated the Chiefs. Had a couple of good games early. Had that monster game against the Steelers that was mostly powered by the 98 yard catch and run. But I mean, take nothing away. You still got to make that play that not many people do. Um, but then things kind of tailed off and I, and I'm, I, I'm just, I'm curious, you know, if there's a bounce with back the, in his. With the perspective of volume here, Scooter, uh, Stefan Diggs, 154 targets, nine drops. Gabe Davis, 93 targets, seven drops. Yeah. No, that's a high, that's a, that's a significant percentage. Yeah, no, it, it is. And it's, it's, 
it's strange to me, and again, this is anecdotal, but it seemed that the previous seasons, and I know he's a young player, and I, I and he's he's developing and improving every time out, which is the idea, or at least that's that's the hope, right? Is that you know, is he did something happen to to create a drop off this year? At least that's that's how it appeared in the second half of the season. I, look, I, I think probably there's all kinds of factors that go into that, including the fact that, you know, Josh Allen was probably not the same after he got hurt, at least early on. Although there, there was a clip that Stefan Diggs put out on social media. I think it was when he caught his touchdown against the lions on Thanksgiving. And it was, I think that was the game after or two games after the jets game. And um, it was a clip of, of Josh Allen throwing to Diggs in the back of the end zone and Stefan Diggs's caption was he threw it so hard he fell over. So he, he wasn't throwing with a governor on his elbow at that point. If he was throwing so hard that his momentum carried him uh, through, sometimes you see outfielders do that, I guess, with an exaggerated crow hop going toward the plate. So, um, you know, I think there's still a lot to come out in the wash with some of that uh, as to, you know, bumps and bruises again, that's it is part of the game. We've had that discussion before, and I know you've seen it both, you know, on less severity and, of course, you know, ridiculously high worry when it came to some other uh, instances on the field this season. Jonah? No, I was just – But, Jonah, I want to make sure Jonah's awake there. I, we, we were going on a long, uh, a long time without including Jonah, and I feel shame for that. No, I was, and that's I was checking your math because I think the difference between Gabe Davis's drops and Stefan Diggs's drops from a percentage standpoint might look significant, but it's really the difference of maybe one drop on either end. You know, one play, two plays changes those numbers. I think it I, seemed like Gabe Davis dropped the ball a lot more, but actually looking into the numbers that you put, it's it's not that big of a difference. Seven on ninety-three targets. Versus so six nine on ninety-three on targets. Four targets. Huh? You made that six. Well, I don't. We don't need to make this a math thing, but that—that that was what I was going to interject and say after my nap. <laughs> let's talk basketball so we can get Jonah involved. Oh no, wait. Let's not talk basketball. Let's talk Sabers. Uh, Scooter. Yeah. Now that uh, now that the NHL is a Turner property and has been for a little bit. Um, yeah. Yeah. And the Sabres are surging a little bit. I know that your Buffalo ties, which maybe we should explain, they come from your father. You were you were raised in the Philadelphia area. Outside um, of Washington. I'm sorry. Outside of Washington, you went to college at LaSalle. Um, so you were um, you inherited your father's uh, yeah. Bills fandom, uh, sadly. Uh, but uh, what about your uh, your Sabres? You know, I, I think this has been written probably by uh, Matthew Fairburn, uh, amongst others, that the Sabres are following that Bill's blueprint. At least that's the hope with, you know, they've got. I don't know if it's this. I don't know if this is true after the Cousins extension, but they were the youngest team with the lowest payroll. Um, and as they fill in the mortar around the bricks with that team, um, you can see what's coming you can see and so there gets to be that point where it's like okay these guys are up and comers they're exciting they're going to put up five five to six goals every night um they're exciting well when does it go from you know exciting to okay you got to make the playoffs and so i think that's kind of where we are we're kind of in that that year that the bills played jacksonville where it could kind of go either way um you know they had that nationally televised game right before the all-star break where um I mean, for lack of a better term, it just looked like they got smothered by a better team. Um, and look, the, hur the Hurricanes are fantastic. I don't think there's much debate about that. But, you know, you had seen the Sabres play well against other teams and played well on the road against other teams, too. And so they kind of, I don't want to say they laid an egg, but they, they kind of got pushed around a little bit in that game. Um, wasn't as concerning as Tage Thompson's injury. So, you know, I don't know if that's like something that's nagging, because if you recall earlier in the week, he had missed practice. And I think that Don Granato said it was for Jonah. Maiden. What's what's the latest on Tage Thompson? What do we? Well, he practiced today and he's playing tomorrow. Now, now maybe this is a, 
a nagging thing that becomes recurring. But at this point, it seems like he's healthy and ready to go. And the vibe out of the Sabres that the All-Star break was the break he needed to okay. heal that injury. Okay. And so, look. The only thing helped. missing was him going to play golf at Pebble Beach. <laughs> right, well, and exactly. he went to a beach and threw a football, I don't know how many yards, but he looked like a person with a healthy upper body while he was on his beach vacation. So the, the question with them then becomes... He had no right? shirt on. It looked like a very healthy upper body. Perfect. Excellent. You guys need a, uh, a medical sponsor for this show as well. <laughs> um, so I guess the question is, if you guys remember, I think you guys actually talked about this, maybe last podcast or the previous podcast, about how in that push for the playoffs, Brandon Bean went out and got Kelvin Benjamin... I think they traded a sixth or seventh round pick for him. And um, it was, you know, by the way, if they were able to get Beckham, they would have the three receivers not named Mike Evans from that particular draft. But but Benjamin was going to be the guy and and he was going to help the offense, kind of give him a shot in the arm. I don't think that ever actually happened. Oh, I think he had a big touchdown in the uh, snow game. Um, and, and they went out and did that and, and they made the playoffs. Do the Sabres do the same thing? Are they are they looking to get a veteran presence? Um, is there somebody out there that that they could get? And I think Jonah, it always goes back to can they get whoever that person is, and it doesn't mess up whatever their projected finances are because they know they're going to have to pay some guys, uh, including Darlene, uh, probably more than the going rate coming up soon. Um, I should probably always say uh, Rasmus Darlene and say you know. Uh, Norris, tro Norris Trophy uh, favorite. What yeah, do you? I, your... I don't think. Well, I just want to respond. I don't yeah, think that. I'm sorry. They are going to make a major move. I think that trying to thread that needle of of adding to the team, especially on the forward line, with a player that doesn't block development of the other young players or doesn't change the future cap sheet in a way that they don't want, is going to be too difficult without giving up too many assets, too many picks. They might be able to make a fringe move probably to the defensive corps and maybe somebody that helps on the penalty kill uh, that maybe helps the team competitively. But I don't know if that's what the fan base is looking for as a we're going for it. We're, we're ending the drought type move that some people are anticipating a goaltender or a high scoring forward. They don't really need much more scoring. Right. Right. I was going to ask you, Scooter, because I know you have these conversations around the studio. Uh, and maybe they don't make it to air. And perhaps you're not at liberty to say these types of things because it's just a bunch of hockey experts talking. But you have a decorated staff there, uh, a crew uh, with your NHL on TNT broadcasts. When you're just shooting the bull about the Sabres, what kind of information are guys like Gretzky and Weeks and, and, the, and the rest talking about? Well, uh, as much as I enjoy Kevin Weeks' analysis, he is an ESPN uh, oh, guy. Uh, but but that's um, a I'm are, can we still be friends? Biz. It's all 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 good. All good. Biz, so, I was trying. Who's you know, the new talk? The next talk it, it, You know, whatever yeah, you got. So, going. Yeah. So what we so, so a couple things. One. So it's, it's Paul Bisnett, Anson Carter. Um, and it was Rick Tockett. Those were the regulars. Right. And Wayne Gretzky um, uh, works with us on on tent pole events and playoffs and and this year we have the Stanley Cup final so you'll see him and um and that's obviously pretty amazing to have the greatest player of all time just kind of wandering around and uh more than happy to talk about a variety of topics including you know when he would you know grow up and and um he you know loved playing lacrosse and baseball as much as he loved playing hockey which is you know mind blowing in the age of specialization now right so um we lost Rick Tockett to Vancouver. I say that as though he like went off into the ether, but no, he, he took a job coaching the Vancouver Canucks. Uh, and that's a huge loss because Rick gave us a, you know, uh, uh, an elite player perspective from his playing days. Cause he was one of those two way guys that could score and, and also mix it up as you've seen by his career penalty numbers. And I think he's actually either the leader or second. I think he's the leader in Gordy Howe hat tricks. I think all time. Um, I think that's true. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, I, I, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. And I would ask him questions all the time and he was extremely patient explaining all kinds of stuff to me and, and was a, a, but he would look at games with a coach's perspective. And so it's great to see him back. I think this is a wonderful opportunity for him and, and wish him 
nothing but success. He would talk about Darlene when he would, when they talked about the Sabres back of house, he would talk about his improvement. He would talk about, you know, he, he, he could get real technical on, on Darlene's ability to get past people and how he would be able to do it. And it had to do with, you know, uh, his, his mobility, his dexterity, a, a lot of different things with angles and skating. Um, Wayne was big on uh, Owen Power last year and thought that he would be a difference maker for the team. And his time on ice uh, kind of uh, goes with what Wayne was thinking. The guy's out there all the time as a, is he even 20 at this point? Um, so, you know, that, that's what those guys would talk about along with, with the, the, uh, the ascension of Thompson into superstardom as a, you know, just a guy that had to be dealt with. Um, and, you know, the funny thing is we actually have uh, Jen Bottrell does some work for us as well. And her brother was the one who engineered the trade to bring Paige Thompson to Buffalo. Um, uh, I don't think that's ironic, but it's a cool little, you know, backstage. I'll bring it up to her from time to time. And she I think it might laughed. be ironic that that's the trade that got him fired. Right. That's right. the irony. <laughs> I don't think right. it is a trade that got him fired, though. You say that a lot of people say that. I don't think it did. I, I, well, what do you think it was? I think it was not firing the scouts and reorganizing the front office in the way that he was told to do. And the general disappointing finish of that season, that trade could have saved his job, maybe in a way, if it, if Tate Thompson was that good right away. But the Sabres were embarrassed by what happened with, uh, with Ryan O'Reilly. Well, and the Sabres ownership told Jason Bottrell to trade Ryan O'Reilly. I, I mean, I just, I don't know. I, I, right. I think that Jason Bottrell got fired for a lot of reasons. And I think that was maybe part of the, the whole totality of the reasons, but I don't think he, that's the trade that got him fired. Why don't you ask Jen about that scooter and uh, have them talk about it. <laughs> <one more. laughs> Let's get to the bottom of this. Yeah. I would like to know what Jason Bottrell thinks, why he got fired. I don't think well, he's ever came out and answered that question. I, I have had a text conversation with Jason Bottrell, uh, and uh, he is he has politely uh, declined uh, to to be interviewed about uh, uh, about anything, uh, especially how well Tage Thompson's playing. I thought he um, was good. I thought you were going to say he told yeah, he told me that's the trade that got me fired. Never should have made it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, who's to say what we did text about that I can't report? But yeah. Um, I will say the, the one name I do want to drop, you mentioned Owen power. And I think I tweeted this out, but I want to mention it here on the podcast because I should save things for the podcast and not just give it out there for free. People should, if you want to get some nuggets. So I've had um, opportunity to speak with Scotty Bowman a handful of times over the last couple of months for different things. Uh, just coincidental a story I did. And when it was a bill story about uh, how great coaches make sure that uh, reasons don't turn into excuses uh, for losing, you know, re regarding everything that was going on with the bills as they were entering the postseason. And prior to that, I'd, I'd talked to him for a story on Rasmus Dahlin, uh, and also a story on Dominic Ashik. But so it had been a month or so month and a half since I'd spoken to him. And when I called him about the bills story and he said, before we get started on that, I want to, I want to tell you that, uh, Whatever I, I said some things about Darlene and Owen Power being and how good they were. And he says, I sold them short. They're even better than I thought. And this was after a month of watching them. You know, this would have been through, I guess, December. He was saying, especially Owen Power. I mean, he I mean, Darlene has already you're seeing with your naked eye what Darlene can be. Owen Power, right. you still have to imagine it a little bit. And I think in an, a trained eye like Scotty Bowman. Uh, and you mentioned Wayne. So now Scotty Bowman and Wayne Gretzky are huge fans of Owen Power. I would say that's a pretty good. Uh, th those are pretty good uh, uh, critics uh, to have in your in your corner. Yeah, I, I think that probably works uh, for that. Well, so what? Not to go back to Jason Bothell, but did he? Forgive my memory here. Did he draft Ali number one? Yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks, because right. I get confused with who but was where. Power. The, he was the gone before have, they picked power. Right, right. The Sabres have churned through so many GMs and coaches. If you ask me who was around for that, I, I have to look it up. I can't sure. I can't do it from memory. Jason Bottra, I would think, probably drafted most of these players. Yeah. At least from a certain, you know, young player prospect age standpoint. 
Yeah, no, that's that's a great point. I mean, I, I look, I, 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 it's unfortunate. It just seems like the proof is in the pudding. If you look back, that maybe they're here a little earlier because whatever happened when Kruger was the coach kind of put a hold on development. Again, I don't know enough to know enough, but it seems like Darlene sure plays better and Skinner sure plays better. Actually, you could look at Skinner who played better before and played better after. So I think you kind of have an idea there. Um, and that what might know, have been know, the problem. Well, I mean, I remember when Granado takes over and, and, um, and they had a surge, right? And I think I may have even texted with you, Tim, about, to me, it, you have to be very careful with that type of thing, right? Because it's almost like when a team that's out of the pennant race in baseball plays great in September. And it's like, well, okay, well, you know, now they're, you know, loose and fancy free and, and you know, there's no, there's no pressure, right? So when the Sabres are finishing out the string, the difference was, I think, is that the Sabres were actually beating good teams at that point who still had plenty to play for playoff positioning, home ice, whatever it may have been. And now you kind of see that it, it wasn't uh, necessarily uh, a fluke. And, and it does appear that when this team is healthy, which again is a giant wild card in both football and hockey, right? Is that, well, actually any professional sport, but those two collision sports, especially is that, that, okay, if they're healthy, this is a team to be reckoned with. Um, and then the question always comes back to goaltending. Scooter, I think we've we hopefully we haven't taken up all your time. Do we have a few more minutes to talk about uh, LeBron James? Oh, of course. Are we out of time? No, no, no. We, okay, good. okay. I'm sorry. Right, what did LeBron I, I, James do? What's the news on LeBron? He got traded. I know he didn't play last night. He did not. <laughs> he did not. What um what was Tuesday night like for you when LeBron James breaks the record on your air? Um. And what goes into that? Well, it was the, the, the leading up to it is 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 a little wild um, because you're trying to hit a moving target, as I'm sure Disney, the Disney company was as well, to see if there was a game that he was going to break the record on their air or our air, or if there was a game that wasn't scheduled for national television. Does one of the broadcasters pick that up? Um, and you know, it, so that kind of went into, I mean, discussions upon discussions about, okay, let's look at this game. If he does it here, let's look at this. And, and if he scores 30 and if he scores 40 each game. And remember, there were a couple games where he was, he was really, really, uh, you know, scoring at a heavy pace. And so it was one of those where like, okay, if he, if he speeds it up, do we have to move up our plans? We were looking at games next week as well in case, you know, uh, sprained ankle, what, you know, God forbid uh, something a little bit more serious and you, you figure it out. So there was a lot of, of stress and angst that goes into that because you just don't know, like it, it's, it's, it's a, you don't have any control over it. Right. And so you're trying to figure out where to, where to hit that target. Uh, fortunately we had already scheduled last night. Tuesday was a game we picked up, but it was a TNT night. So we had to go through the process to make sure that we do that. Um, and by the way, we should mention OKC in relation to real quick. This wasn't what your question was, but Oklahoma City to me looks like the Sabres version in the NBA. They're young. They're hungry. Uh, they have a star. So Tage Thompson would be uh, Shea Gilgis Alexander and they're on the verge. And so, you know, it's just a map to me, in my opinion, it's just a matter of time with both. So getting back to, to, to LeBron, um, you know, you're trying to, to figure out, um, you know, what's going to happen. So the NBA orchestrates and choreographs a lot of, a lot of what's going to happen. You know, we knew that Kareem was going to be there. We knew Adam Silver was going to be there. Um, you know, and then it's, if he, if he breaks it, uh, this happens and, and we're going to stop the game. And, but, but what if he breaks it and it's a close game down the stretch, there was a contingency for that. Um, and then, um, you know, there, there were a variety of, of different possibilities that might happen. So you want, but, but the biggest thing is you want to make sure you stay there, right. Stay in the moment. Right. So I, I wasn't, a, I wasn't a sports fan. I wasn't watching when Henry Aaron passed Babe Ruth, 
Um, but that was a, a historical moment. You know, I, I do remember when Barry Bonds passed Henry Aaron and it was a little, it was kind of muted because of the controversy surrounding Bonds. Uh, I remember Cal Ripken breaking Lou Gehrig's streak and how that was kind of a coming together of Cal and the fans at Camden Yards. LeBron's a little different because he's played. We grew up. We grew up with Pete Rose chasing Ty Cobb also where the national broadcasts would check in because baseball is a different sport when you're looking for that hit. You know, you can't just show every Reds game because if he goes over uh, or right. he might go three for four or he might not have a hit for three days. So that's right. Um, that's right. So anyway, I'm so, sorry. I, I, I yeah, derailed no, no. you. There. No, no, it, it, it's all good. I mean, if we knew they were going to stop down, we knew there was going to be a ceremony. Um, but, you know, sometimes I think when Drew Brees passed Tom Brady, it was like, here's the ball. He ran off, gave it to his wife and kids. Back took out. a picture, I think, took a quick picture with his kids and back on the field. Right. Right, right. So, you know, that's the other uh, extreme with it. And, and so um, it was, uh, again, it was, it was great for us when those events occur at home, you know, just because the crowd is into it and the arena is electric and, you know, especially in Los Angeles, you know, or even Madison Square Garden, you're going to have stars that are out. So it kind of has a different feel and vibe. Um, and the Lakers are in, I think, 12th or 13th place right now. So they might not have that on a normal Tuesday night game. It is what it is. So, um, you know, the, the thing that was a little uh, – well, we had to be on our toes, I should say, is at the end of the game, we knew LeBron was going to – well, I shouldn't say we knew. We, we, we thought LeBron was going to talk to our studio after the game. <clears throat> but we, we thought there may be – game ends there's you know maybe he goes to the locker room and puts the headset on back there or, or what have you game ends he daps up some of his guys some of okc and heads right for the scorers table to put the headset on and i'm watching it and i'm like well that's us we better hurry up and get to him you know um and uh you know the 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 game producer was in his ear basically saying hey can you hear the studio show and he said yes sir and so he said he knew as he heard that, he knew that everything was, you know, LeBron was in a good mood, even though they lost. Obviously, you know, you got to weigh that type of stuff. Um, and then he was on with the studio guys that night was uh, Adam Lefko, uh, Candace Parker, Jamal Crawford and, and Shaq. So, it, you know, in the end, it worked out great. Um, but there were a lot of uh, a lot of if this, then that discussions that were had and late night emails and texts and moving games. And can we do this and can we do that? And um you know, it was unfortunately he got banged up at the end of that game and didn't play last night. Um, so that was that was kind of that was unfortunate. But uh, it was uh, it was it was a lot of fun to have on our air. You know, we had Stephen Curry last year breaking the three point record on our air. Um, it's just kind of it's just kind of cool to have those under your umbrella. And, and you can plan for it, but you got to get lucky as well. Do you have a favorite game that's happened on your air? Uh, for me, and I always screw these stats up. Um, there were two. Right, so go ahead, because I got one. Okay, well, for, so, for no, me, you, you go, you go. For me, when, it was when I was producing games. So there were two. There was a a playoff game where the the Pacers were playing the Nets in uh, the Meadowlands, and Reggie Miller hit a half court shot to send the game to overtime and and they wound up losing it was a game five when they used to play five game series in the first round the nets were in a really good place back then they were going to the finals a couple years in a row and it was just a knockdown drag out super exciting ball game um it was you know reggie miller versus jason kidd it was it was it was awesome um the the other one would have been the game where lebron was facing off against the pistons and I think he scored either 19 or 21 straight points. Um, I think he finished with 48, nine and eight. And it was, it, it was a game. I don't want to mess this up. I believe it was a game. It was an Eastern conference final game and it was game five. So it put him up three, two, then they won game six, the next game to go to the finals. I think that was the year they played the Spurs and got swept, but it was the start. Um, and let, let me say one thing about, LeBron real quick because I kind of I started producing games in 1999 he came in the league in 2003 and 
when I was producing games, I don't know how it is now, but when I did games for basically the first decade of that century, if you went to a game that he was wor- – if I worked a game that he was playing it, and you got to the arena early, you know, and, we, and you always get to the arena where you're working, and you usually go in to eat uh, three hours out. So if the game's at 8 o'clock, you eat at 5 o'clock. And, you know, usually in the truck doing everything that needs to be done to get a game ready, and then you, you walk in, there's like a probably a media room of some sort where – dinner's laid out for whoever's working the game and kobe was like this also and it shows you that greatness is not an accident right lebron's out there getting a full workout in before the game and you guys remember when he first came up uh his shooting was the big question you know all the other skills were kind of assumed and you could see it but it it was could he shoot because eventually guys are going to play off him they're going to call his bluff he's going to have to be able to hit open jump shots and he worked on that so much uh if you look at his shooting percentages and their ascension um it's pretty remarkable but there's a reason for it it's because he was out there busting his butt all the time to improve that and people don't see that because it happens so early before the game right a lot of times we're not broadcasting that back it's an everyday occurrence but it's one of those things where uh he would do it kobe bryant would do it reggie miller would do it ray allen would do it i'm sure there are other guys that i didn't see but those four without fail every single game. That's impressive. What was your game, Jonah? You had a game uh, that happened well, on it was his more era. of a post game, but I would say the all-time greatest inside the NBA on TNT moment is when Chris Paul and James Harden were on the Rockets and they tried to break into the Clippers locker room through the back door. <laughs> and we covered live <laughs> like it was CNN on uh, by Kenny and Ernie and Shaq and Charles. Well, and and Roz Golden Woody was the uh, was the reporter for site, and she was just trying to relay what was happening. And I think she said that there was a police presence, and Charles and Shaq just fell out because <laughs> they thought that was the the funniest thing they had ever heard. Because those guys don't need a police presence; that they don't need a police presence. <laughs> um, uh, Jonah, I would I would say um, <laughs> I forget. I remember that. I would say the one that I enjoyed was with the late, great Kobe Bryant. He had just filmed a feature, not a feature. He just filmed a commercial with Nike. And it was where he put on these Nikes and, and there was a car that would drive at him. Yes. And he jumps in the car, right? And so, and then we did ours where Kenny, Kenny went out there and he like put the shoes on and he was getting ready. And we, and Kobe, this was after a game. So Kobe's back at house, got the headset on, he's watching the monitor and we show him like this is an ode to your commercial, and Kenny just gets blasted by the car. <laughs> and, and then we showed it in slow motion, and you could see like the driver of the car was Ernie with this big smile on his face, and and Kobe just he was crying, he was laughing so hard. And that that was one of the one of the better moments for sure. I, we, last uh, question: we, we do have a good time. It's late at night, but we have a good time. Well, that's that what we me love right about in. the NBA, and then the way TNT specifically presents the NBA that it's it's. Probably, if it's not the best sport, it's, I think, the most entertaining sport to follow and, and get interested in. And uh, that show has changed the way all other sports approach their studio shows with little cartoons and the vignettes and the jokes. I don't really think there was too much of that. Or if they tried, they weren't very good at it. But well, now everybody's it, it feels that, that that's the way to go. Let me expand this discussion because I know you're like, this is the longest TJAF we've had we don't need this, any more of it but just to give you a little bit of I context, have another question so please okay. all right well let me give you a little bit of context so back in like 1994 95 Turner Sports changed um, management and they they brought in a guy named Harvey Schiller and Harvey Schiller came from the U.S. Olympic Committee um, he had been the executive director there before that I believe he was the commissioner of the SEC so they brought him in, and, and what, what Harvey did was he hired two guys. He hired a guy named Michael Jackson, who had played in the NBA for the Sacramento Kings and had played at Georgetown during their glory years, and he was like the special assistant. He was going to make things go. He also had an incredible Rolodex uh, for both behind the scenes and also former NBA players. Now, you might think, okay, well, like who? Well, his backcourt mate was Kenny Smith. 
He also played with Danny Ainge. Like there, so he had like these other guys that he hired because he knew these guys were smart and they knew the game, but more importantly, they knew how to project it, right? The other guy, and also he he took pity on me and hired me. The other guy that that Harvey Schiller hired was a guy named Mike Pearl to be the executive producer of Turner Sports. Mike Pearl came from a, an Olympic background at ABC and CBS. But the other thing Mike Pearl did was he was in on the ground floor with the creation of the NFL Today. So the NFL Today, as people may not realize, but that was the, the forefather, the pioneer, the trailblazer of all sports studio shows. And so Mike Pearl was involved in creating that and creating what you see on Inside the NBA, which is an incredible run of influence and a legacy that is probably going to be unmatched in sports broadcasting. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people will watch what we air and people even work with us that don't necessarily understand it. It wasn't always that way. It started to started to pivot back in the mid nineties and we are where we are because of Michael and Mike in a huge way. There, there look, there's hundreds and thousands of people that have contributed behind the scenes. Those guys set the tone, set the culture. We talk about that in sports all the time, right? That starts at the top. Those guys were at the top. Uh, last question for you, because we always uh, need to get caught up on any great uh, Charles Barkley stories from behind the scenes. However, <laughs> I want to include, I want to maybe broaden it a little bit because you do now work with Wayne Gretzky. You mentioned it already. And I know that you work with these guys, so you're obviously biased uh, and you're not going to uh, trash anybody. Uh, if, even if they were jerks, I'm sure you wouldn't say. But what's it like to work with legends like that? Because you're a fan. You grew up a fan. You watch these guys. You know these they're larger than life. And now you're, you're working alongside them. And Barkley's been for a long, long time. It's not like you just woke up and, sure. and uh, you know, Barkley was there, you know, a month ago. But is, does it, do you get used to it? Is it, uh, I, I, I don't want to overload the question too much, but. What's it like for you as a, as a fan? Um, it's a little intimidating at first and then everything kind of, you know, finds its own level. And those guys have always been great. Um, you and I have talked about Charles before. He's always terrific. Shaq is great. Um, we had Dwayne Wade for a few years and he was, he was terrific. I mean, I, I remember going to Dwayne Wade and asking him tips on, you know, my, my son was, going to face a box and one in middle school basketball. And he, he was like, and I said, you have any advice? He's like, Ooh, that was no fun. I'm like, wait, wait, that's the advice. You didn't like it when you played against it. Like, but then he gave me, he gave me some, some ways to try and attack it. Um, Wayne is, you know, uh, Wayne is just kind of a, maybe because he is consensus, the number one guy, you know, it's a little different. Um, but he's, but you know, he's sitting out there having conversations, and you're talking to him, and like there's a fight that goes on, and he said, well, "That was a good one." Like, why? Why was that a good one? And he breaks down why it was a good one, or you know, he, he you know, he's got certain thoughts on, um, you know, how teams are built, or um, uh, wants to talk about when he was growing up. I guess the first good basketball team he watched was the Golden State Warriors with Rick Barry, or whatever. It's just, it's just a little different. Um, you know, I, I, and the other thing about, but Wayne, actually all the guys, but Wayne specifically, because I actually, uh, we had a game, we had a series in Edmonton last year. And so he was back in Edmonton doing the series. And the night before there was a bunch of us sitting around having a conversation at the, you know, the lobby bar and he was part of it. And, you know, it's Wayne Gretzky in Edmonton. Um, but you know, people came up to him and he was just as gracious as you would hope. Right. Like just especially with kids. Right. I think that's kind of the, the great differentiator with differentiator with a lot of these guys is the kids. But he was great with everybody. And so it's just really nice to when your quote unquote heroes live up to that when they're talking to you. Like, I, again, I don't cover them, so I'm not being critical of them. So maybe it's a different back and forth if Charles is dealing with, you know, whoever was the beat writer in philly or phoenix you know that may have had to be critical or the the, the the columnist that had to be critical that's a little different different dynamic um you know even like henrik lundquist um who was you know going to be a first ballot hall of famer i believe right like the guy's resume is 
is spectacular. Um, again, super down to earth and has no problem breaking down, um, you know, goalie play, you know, like just in the most basic of terms for the casual fan and talking to you behind the scenes about it. And then it goes out and it's on television. Um, the other person I would add to that is, you know, I'm sure there are many arguments about who the goat in women's basketball is, but Candace Parker works for us. And she would be, I would imagine I, I, she's on my Mount Rushmore of, of female basketball players. And, and she's wonderful um, to talk about, you know, all the, the machinations of both, both uh, uh, associations with the, the W and the NBA. So um, I don't think it hits me their stature and how they're looked unless there are guests that come in, which happens every once in a while, like a youth league team will come in and, and, you know, the dads are more excited than the play, you know, the kids may not realize just how great Charles was or, or what have you. Oh, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't add um, uh, Pedro to that list. Um, And my son is a pitcher and uh, you know, Pedro talked pitching with him for two hours during the baseball playoffs. And I, Again, my son's 13, so he doesn't know without the, the uh, you know, the magic of the internet, Pedro's great. He, he doesn't know who this guy is. He's just like, Dad, I'm having trouble understanding him. No, well, no, I, I would love to have a second language I could speak as well as Pedro speaks English, you know, but, but, um, but he was, I mean, he was just so gracious and, and all that. And I tried to explain to my son, I'm like, you know, that's like Dwayne Wade talking to you for two hours about guard play. Like, that's what that is on, on the greatness scale. Um, so, you know, the guys that we have and, and, you know, whether it's how they are as people or whether it's how our talent department goes after to recruit folks, um, there's always a, a common denominator of, they're good guys when it comes to, you know, sitting down and, and breaking down the game or anything else, you know, Reggie Miller and Grant Hill fall into that category as well. I mean, Grant even more so because Grant does, you know, both studio and games. So, you know, he's around all the time, um, maybe even more than he'd like to be, but, uh, but has no problem, you know, giving you a peek behind the curtain with, you know, how things work and how the NBA is and, and, you know, basketball in general, because of course he does the tournament too. Scooter, thanks for this. I don't want Jonah, any, any last questions for Scooter as we're uh, abusing his time here? No, not really. Hmm. Well, I thought, I thought we were going to spend more time talking about um, LaSalle St. Bonaventure and what a big win that was. And, you know, is this the end for, Mark Schmidt at St. Bonaventure. And, is and this, all that. The, uh, I, this is the end for Mark Schmidt. Like it, this podcast. Yeah. This is the end for Mark Schmidt. Like it's the end for Brandon Bean. <laughs> yeah, the, the guy who asked me the question, you know, could this be the end for Brandon Bean? I'm like, you have to understand who's going to be making this decision. And it's a guy who knows he hasn't made a lot of good ones and he's tired of losing with both of his teams. And he's finally got one. I don't think he's going to go rolling the dice uh, again. Uh, and hope that he does th- and, and try to avoid the next um, Doug Whaley. Someone has to get fired, though. The Bills were entitled, the Bills fans were entitled to win the Super Bowl, have a parade this year, and they didn't, and someone must be held accountable. Jim Salgado. Jim Salgado and Chad Hall told to take a hike. I don't know. I, I don't want to say, I don't want to put that out there, that Chad Hall was told to take a hike, but... Right. Uh, he took a lateral move, which is a clue, right? Well, to be allowed to, to interview for a lateral move is the Bills saying, "Go ahead, we're gonna, you can go ahead and do that." It was similar to the special teams coordinator last year, correct? Yes. I also should say this: I don't know Chad Hall's contract status. Maybe his contract was up. Oh, fair. But it sounds to me is that the uh, let's just it's a lateral move, and that, that's a that's an indicator. Um, Scooter, thank you for this. Uh, always a treat. Um, and, uh, we will go back to texting each other, uh, seven or eight times a day and, and taking it off the air. But for now we have a podcast that people can, uh, listen into, uh, to the three of us and our thoughts. Always a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Uh, and I, I think I'm legally ob- obligated. Don't I have to finish every interview I do by saying go bills? You can do that. No, you don't. You don't have to say that. <laughs> huh? 
Scooter Vertino from, let me just, because it's, I got to get used to it, from Warner Brothers Discovery Sports. But for years and years, Turner Sports, Senior Vice President of Programming and Production. NBA.com, NBA Network, right? Do we throw all that in there? Is that still under your umbrella? Yes. NBA WNBA. TV. Yeah, not the W as much. No. But NBA. Yeah. yeah. It's too much. It's too much. What about you, you Turner Classic to- Movies? Uh, yeah, not not a lot going on with me there, though. No. All right, CNN. No, right. sir. No, no, sir. Scooter Rathino, thank you for joining Tim Graham and friends. Brought to you by CTBK CPAs and business consultants. CTBK is more than just a full service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach that takes on each new challenge with collaborative problem solving skills to provide creative solutions for their clients. Based right here in Western New York. CTBK is a champion for your business and our community. Additionally, CTBK goes beyond tax and attest services by offering a wide array of consulting and outsourced solutions tailored to meet the unique needs of your business, allowing you to focus on your operational and long-term strategic goals. Whether you're a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, the team at CTBK is determined to help you succeed. Visit ctbk.com or call 716 716- 630-2400, 716-630-2400 to learn how CTBK's one-team approach can work for you.